Howdy again, everybody, and thanks for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale, and joining me, as always, my partner in crime, the Tom to my Jerry, the Chip to my Dale, the Regis to my Kathy Lee, Mr. Kyle Filio Filson. How's it going out there, everybody? We are so glad you're in, uh, joining us today. I hope everybody had a good Labor Day weekend and uh, are ready to hear some really cool stories. Okay, today we're going to talk about a recent UFO sighting in Texas. Comparing reported Bigfoot vocalizations, a recent ferry sighting, the Aurora crash, and the mystery airships of the Sonora Aero Club. Then we're going to talk about a do-it-yourself Elysium-style vest. So it sounds like it's going to be an action-packed episode. I can't wait to get into it. Cam, how you been? I've been great, man. I have been having a blast and, and doing all this research, and I think I'm going to have to build me an exoskeleton. Man, I would love to have one of those. It's... I'm, I'm going to save it there, like I said. I'm, we're going to hold on to that for a little bit. I'm not going to jump right into it. But, uh, yeah, I, it's something you and I are going to have to look into. I think we're going to have to mess around and build one of those things. We were talking about building that time-traveling device, and we may have to put that on hold to build an exoskeleton. But I, I'd like to build a, a catapult. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You going to be getting into pumpkin chunking? No, just something for fun. Just like a small one? Yeah. You really ought to do that. The boys would love it. Yeah, I think it'd be neat. I'd like to build like a six foot tall uh, trebuchet or something. Yeah, where they we can sling <laughs> stuff out of it. Oh, let's do that. It'd be neat, right? It'd be I like a so. science experiment, too, so the kids could learn how to throw stuff. I think it'd be awesome. Yeah, we may have to check into that. Folks, if any of y'all out there have any, uh, uh, any plans or any knowledge of that, shoot us an email. Go ahead and you can, you know you can email the show. Shoot us an email on some plans or whatnot before we get started, or tell us what not to do so we don't knock a tooth out or <laughs> or, or get wiped out. But uh, yeah, because that could be totally dangerous. Mm, right on, right on. Well, let's get into today's stories. All right, Philly. I don't know if you've been reading on any on uh, OpenMinds TV, but apparently Texas is slowly gathering up more and more UFO sightings. Man, it does seem like there's been a lot of activity lately. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Uh, this just happened the 24th of this month. And it took place in Fairfield. Folks, Fairfield's it's about 90 to 100 miles. I think it's a little less than 100, around 90 miles or so south of Dallas. Uh, it's not a real big city. I want to say it's got a population of maybe 3,000 people. It's not yeah. a huge little town. But uh, this was actually written by Roger Marsh, and he actually reported that there was a huge UFO reported hovering over this little town in Texas. And what it says is a Texas witness at Fairfield reported watching a, I quote, very bright white light UFO at close range. Now, what ended up happening was, is the witness was patrolling a county road. So I'm assuming this was a, a, a an officer or maybe just kind of hanging out. I don't know. But it says on her way to a county road, uh, 833 at 847 p.m. on August 24th, when an object was first seen and thought to be part of a tower. So she pulled her vehicle over to the side of the road. She says this huge, very bright object went up and traveled slowly to my right. Then I heard this jet-like noise that ended as quickly as it started. I put the truck in gear and went down the county road 833 and turned around. By this time, it was coming back to the spot I had first noticed it. Now, Roger writes that the witness again parked her vehicle, and while watching the object, noticed lights on top of it. It says that they went from one side to the other and had a rhythm in its own pace. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking instantly of like close encounters of the third kind, right? Right. That's what I picture. Yeah. And it says the object then moved south and out of sight. Now, the woman says that it scared her just putting that truck in gear and hauling it straight back to the job site. Says, I told a co-worker and I just kept going on and on about it. Took me about three hours to settle down. And I particularly did not want to go back to the truck to go anywhere, period. Says the next day at work, the witness reviewed the area and uh, where the object was hovering. Says, so the next day going back to work, I saw the place the UFO was hovering over, and it was power lines from a power plant. Now, we've heard that from different stories told and all that, as it was ho always hovering like over little power areas or substations. I don't understand that. If you've got the power to travel, you know, millions yeah, it of does, light years. It does seem like they're attracted to power plants. I remember in reading uh, one of Micah Hanks books, I think it was the UFO Singularity, uh, he described a story of a guy that saw one, at, he, and what the guy claimed is it was hovering above a, a large electrical transformer or power plant. It was like drawing power from it. Like it mm. was like recharging its batteries. Just, yeah. <laughs> right? Like your yeah, cell right? phone gets yeah. dead. You dock it wirelessly. It's pulling energy out there, charging for a few seconds, and then took off. But that's what the guy, that's the way the guy described it. Now, this happened, I think he said in the 70s, and this story was even described to him before the everybody had a cell phone in their pocket. So it's mm -hmm. weird 
you know, for him to come up with that line of thought that the thing was recharging. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's, it's just strange like this. It's funny that there's there's more and more stories of, of when they see their scene around power stations. I don't know. It's strange. So I was just I was blown away. I'm like, hmm, another one of these Texas sightings. You know, we've done stories in the past, apparently, and we got a lot of emails came in whenever we did our story about uh, Stephenville. And we discussed that, you know, that we didn't know that it was a real sighting, that it was it didn't seem like it at the time. But we've got a lot more information been sent to us just from us bringing it up. We really may have to revisit that, go back and we may have to go down. I mean, folks, we're only like 45 minutes from there. Yeah. So we could just take a little jag down there and, and check it out. So we really may have to go down there and really dig around and see what happens. And hopefully no man in black show up because I don't <laughs> think I could deal with. <laughs> no, that I don't need that stuff. in my life. Right. Yeah. Now, Philly, I got an email sent to us and, you know, sent to the show. And it was a really interesting story. People, they they know how much we love just a link to this story. They know how much we love fairy stories. Yes. But we also had another story that basically some information we got sent to us that came from the last show. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. About the uh, the Bigfoot the vocalizations yes. that were recorded in yes. Washington. We had a, a listener. In, uh, Mr. Chris Brewer, and he sent us a link. We had talked about the vocalizations Kyle played, and Kyle and I were like, "Man, we, you know, we always talk about you're going to have to come up with something better than that to make us believe that that was a Bigfoot or anybody really." Yeah, I think I mentioned that it could be just a normal animal with just maybe a, a messed up vocal cord or something, mm -hmm. and it sounds a little bit unusual, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's Sasquatch. Exactly. I'm well, not saying that it's not either. It could be. It very well could be. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know what Sasquatch Neither sounds do I. like, you know, no. but I know that, I don't know, I would think it would sound a little bit more primate. Well, Chris sent us a link to a video off of YouTube of red fox sounds. That's right. And right now we're going to play you the comparison. And we, I'm going to play you the uh, clip that we used on the last show of the supposed Bigfoot screaming mm -hmm. sounds from Washington. And then I'll let you know uh, when I play these sounds of a, of a fox. So yeah. let's listen to that. And we don't mean... Red Fox the comedian. We mean Red Fox <laughs> no, the animal. No, no, no. All right, let's, let's, let's give it a listen. Okay. See, now that that was the supposed Bigfoot sounds mm -hmm. from Washington. Now it, let's listen to. Now it is an it is an anonymous or an, an anomaly in the sound that it is. It's a strange noise. I'll give it that. I don't know what it is, but jam the other one. This right here is the uh, red fox. Okay, see, to me, that sounds like primates, does it not? It does. It sounds like... I mean, if I was to tell you, listen to these monkeys, and then played that clip, you would never say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like that. You'd if, say, yeah, okay, I hear them. That's exactly what it sounds like. If you were to play that sound a little bit boistered out of a any kind of thing, you know, just a wait. tape play or anything, blasting it in the woods, I would instantly think that it was primate. It sounds like it's a primate. And yes. if you're already in that mindset, because obviously these people are, because they're out squatching. Mm-hmm. They see these pushed over sticks. They see this stuff and they're like, man, look, what, what is the tree couldn't be broken like that? Well, you know, lots of times it's from the weight of snow in the wintertime. Snow builds up on the branches and the weight of it causes it to break. Mm -hmm. And in the spring, people walk along, they see it broken off at 12 foot high. And they're like, what could have broken it off at that height? It has to have been a Sasquatch. And then you hear those sounds. You're like, holy cow. They're out they're here. They're out here. Well, I always think, too, about woodpeckers or, or wood ants or anything that gets into the wood, eats away, makes a weak spot, just so happens it's way up off the ground. Maybe when they did it, tree limb breaks off, top of the tree breaks out. I don't know. I mean, there's other answers besides instantly going, that's what it is. Well, now, sure. folks, I'm not saying that that's the first sound we played of a Sasquatch isn't a real Sasquatch sound. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying there's other answers before everybody starts going, it's just, it's a Bigfoot. I just recorded a Bigfoot sound. I'm like, did you? Because it sounds to me like maybe you recorded a red fox. Yeah, that's me. I have an open mind. You know, I'm not saying that there doesn't exist or that, that, that that's not a Bigfoot. Could be. Yes. But I'm with you. I need more proof. I can't just hear a strange sound and go, yep, got to be Sasquatch. Yes. Got to be. Well, and and I think everybody needs to be that way. Everybody needs to be very judgmental and very scientific in the approach to all Absolutely. of this. Absolutely, yeah. Because you don't want to get duped by something. Because, I mean, we're all guilty of it. Sure. Everybody's been fooled to something at one time or the other. Just like that. I mean, I, I love the stories of the little people in the woods. Maybe it was a fairy. 
I don't know. Maybe that's what was making this noise. Yeah. I have no idea. Like I said, I want Bigfoot to be real, but I want Dwindy and gnomes and fairies. I want it all to be real. Well, not all. I don't want black eyed children to be real. <laughs> I don't want Slender Man. I don't want Grinning Man. I don't want Shadow Man. I don't want any of that to be the scary stuff. No, I don't want that to be real. Listen to this. So I, I, we had an email sent to us with this link on it. It comes from yourghoststories.com and it's called Fairy in the Woods. Now, the person that wrote this screen name is Wild Star. And it says, my boyfriend and I were working for an environmental organization in Eugene, Oregon. One evening, we attended a work gathering in the woods outside of the city. The woods were owned by an old deadhead with long, flaming red hair who loved to spout nonsense and uh, walked around with the intricately carved cane. Sounds like a pretty <laughs> cool dude. Yeah. The cane was carved by one of the, uh, the many boys in the early 20s who lived in the woods and made a living carving. So they could do backflips from their feet standing, and when they went into the woods with them, they were flipping off of trees and jumping, you know, and just pretty much having fun, it looks like here. says, uh, the owner of the woods took a liking to us and invited us to go to on a short hike with him. He showed us numerous little cages set up around the walk and explained to us that the woods were infested with fairies and that he was going to catch one. And I remember catching my boyfriend's eye and smiling at that. So she says, we stayed up all night. And about an hour before dawn, found us in the woods, sitting on a falling tree, alone together. A tiny creature about an inch or two long and light in color flew up to our faces and hovered in front of his nose. It wasn't a bug, but it didn't look like Tinkerbell, with hair and long limbs. A strange thing happened then. It was like a love spell. We went into a state of sweet amour and came out of it about ten minutes later, in a glade, lying on the ground, uh, you ready for this, Kyle? Yeah, I'm ready. With our shirts off. Bum, bum, bum. What? Um, I'm assuming that they took them off of each other. I don't think they got abducted. <laughs> it says, we had never felt like that before together. In fact, I have never felt like that before ever. So graceful and light and good. It says, I can see why he wanted to catch one. You can't bottle that stuff. Wow. So, whether, I mean, I, let, let's play devil's advocate there. Is it just a story? Or why would you write a story about, you know, seeing these little cages and all this? I want to believe it's real. I want to believe it's real. But is there certain areas? You know, you and I talked about this a while back whenever we were watching. There's, I believe, a documentary on the fairies. And and there's always people that, that claim that there's certain areas in certain woods that have them. Yes. You know, they're not in every patch of woods. It's nope. not like every little cluster of trees. That's just where they're hanging out. They're not like birds. It seems like they're more drawn to these certain areas. So I wonder if up there in Eugene, Oregon, I don't even know what Eugene, Oregon looks like. I'm picturing just big trees and forests and all that stuff. So yeah. that's what I'm picturing that it looks like. So, And probably very, very pretty. That's so, Oh, absolutely. It's beautiful up there. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe they have to kind of find a very beautiful area, and that's where they hang out at. That's Well, there's different parts of the world where they just are seen more often than others, and so I, I really believe that. Maybe there's a portal or some kind of – the. The the film between the two universes is thinner there or something, yeah. and they just step back and forth. I don't know, but it is bizarre that there are certain areas that seem to have a lot of Duende or, or little tiny people, fairies, sightings, you know. But so. it seems to me that it's almost based on the beauty of an area. These yeah. little people seem to be in very you – you know, you don't hear about them being in real like – Just downtown in, Detroit? Well, just any place that's just not aesthetically pleasing. Like, you don't ever see, you know, they're just like out in the middle of just like West Texas. I don't hear any crazy Dwindy sightings in West Texas. No, I don't either. You know, or fairies or nothing out there. Or like Now, it, it always seems like when you get near the deserts and stuff, they get to be creepy sightings. You start getting reptilian sightings. <laughs> you know, you start getting really strange sightings like that. You don't. I think really it's just get... people are dehydrated and start having visions. I don't know. Well, I'll go out there and have some visions on peyote, but I don't, I don't know. It's just a very strange thing. It, it's, it's something that's always in the back of my mind every time I think about these. These, these sightings of the little people. So I hope you like that, folks. We enjoyed it. Thanks for yeah. whoever sent it in. I believe they re they wanted to remain nameless. Yeah. It was just a, a crazy screen name. But anyway, thank you so much for sending that in. Yeah, I always love those stories. Um, Cam. Yes, sir. I'm going to get into, do you know anything about the Aurora crash? Ye well, yeah, I know that it was allegedly the very first UFO crash that was, I think, documented in the United States. Uh, I think it happened in 1898. And it happened not too far from us, honestly. You're very close. It was 1897, actually. Oh, April 19th uh, is when it happened. But, yeah, you're right. Um, 
Now, during the 1896 to 1897 time frame, this was some six or seven years before the Wright brothers actually first had their first flight in 1903. Mm -hmm. There were numerous sightings of cigar-shaped mystery airships that were reported all across the United States. And the first account of an actual crash was, like we said, April 19th, 1897. I'm sorry, 1987. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> April 19th, 1897. Uh, and the Dallas Morning News uh, reported on it, and it was written by a man uh, named S.E. Hayden, and he was actually a resident of Aurora. Now, it stated in that article that an alleged UFO hit a windmill on the property of a Judge J.S. Proctor two days earlier, around 6 a.m. local, which is central time, resulting in a crash. Now, it's UFO. It doesn't say it was a craft or anything. You know, it doesn't mm -hmm. really get into detail. The pilot, who was reported to be not of this world, a Martian, as they called him, according to the, an Army officer from nearby Fort Worth, did not survive the crash and was buried with Christian rites at the nearby Aurora Cemetery. Now, I personally have been to the Aurora Cemetery. Uh, there's a marker there, a history marker in front, but the actual headstone uh, there's nothing there. I mean, you can't find it. Yeah. It just looks like a creepy old cemetery. Mm -hmm. Imagine something like, I don't know, five acres, and that's it. Anyways, the reported records from the crash site, according to the story, was dumped into a nearby well located under the damaged windmill, while some ended up uh, with the alien in the grave. So they added, they buried the alien, I guess, with some of the debris. I don't know why. Adding to this mystery uh, was the story of a Mr. Brawley Oates, who later purchased Judge Proctor's property around 1945. Now, Oates, he cleaned out the debris from the well in order to use it as a water source. And later, he developed an extreme severe case of arthritis, which he claimed to be the result of the contaminated water from the wreckage that was earlier dumped into this well. And as a result, Oates sealed up this well with concrete and placed an outbuilding on top of that. Now, this was all done in 1957. So there's no way now you can go back to that well mm -hmm. and dig it up and see if there's any evidence. So once again, um, there's reported crashed UFO remnants, but then it's gone. There's no way that anybody can go out there and look at it, mm -hmm. which is a shame. Anyways, so this crash was the first time we've ever heard of anything like this. Now, have you are you familiar with other mystery airships and I, their sightings? I remember just uh, reading bits and pieces of it several years ago, and I'm trying to think back right now. Uh, like breakaway society kind of stuff that that was always talked about that 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 the Wright brothers weren't the first That's to right. really invent flight and that there's always been these stories that people have come out that it was invented years before that they were just kind of the ones that got popular with it yeah and, and I'm fascinated by those stories mm -hmm. they really are cool I always think of these you know oh steampunk like antiquated airships you I know with the, the people with, the, with their dress on and the fancy stuff doctor who kind of stuff yes i love the idea of that too now are you familiar with a man named john w keely no sir i don't believe okay so. well, this involves uh his airship uh mr john w keely uh had a an airship that he created uh during the periods of 1888 to 18, 1893 he flew his airship for the first time in 1893 now remember that's 10 years before the Wright brothers achieved flight. Mm -hmm. So this is crazy, right? Now, there's a report uh, about this ship, and, it, and, it's, and here's a quote I'll use. It says, the space which the propeller of the airship occupies is in Keeley's laboratory. It comes within a radius of six feet square, a small space so powerful for a medium, distributing over 1,000 horsepower as tested by an experiment. Hmm. It consists of over 2,000 pieces and weighed in excess of a thousand pounds. It says a small stool was placed on the unit so that it faced a keyboard. Attached to the keyboard were many tuned resonation plates and vibratory mechanisms. Mr. Keeley says that when the plates were polarized with negative attraction, the airship would rise and float above the ground. Isn't that a weird yeah, description? That's a strange thing, though. It says here. That uh, apparently Keeley could make this airship accelerate to any desired speed by dampening out certain notes on the keyboard. Right. So we get more into that whole thing with like they did with lift, allegedly lifting the stones in, in Egypt is with using sound and sound Right, resonance. so that's what this description sounds like. It says even that Keeley's airship was uh, successfully demonstrated to the U.S. War Department in 1896. The demonstration took place in an open field where Keeley brought his airship 
from zero to a very high speed at that time within seconds. So he was able to accelerate from zero to really fast. doesn't say the exact speed. Yeah. But in a short amount of time. The government and War Department were impressed, but they stated they could see no use for such a complex device at that time. Now, airship sightings began to pop up in several states in 1897, which is a year after Keeley supposedly made this demonstration to the U.S. War Department. Uh, so there's still six years before the Wright brothers achieved flight. But it's weird that this guy builds this airship, does a demonstration for the U.S. War Department. They turn him down. And then all of a sudden you start seeing sightings all throughout the United States of these mysterious flying airships. So it makes me wonder, that's fine. They turned him down. Did he take it, like you said, to some breakaway society where somebody said, yeah, I'll take one of those. Yeah. Like a rich playboy. Yeah. Want to be the boss. That's want to right. be the man. <laughs> that's right. He's like, yeah. I mean, you know, guys paid a lot of money for cars. If you, had a, if you had a lot of money and somebody had an airship, you'd be like, I'm buying it. Well, and I wonder, too, if, if they get away by saying that the Wright brothers invented flight by the fact that it wasn't an airship, it was a plane. If that's kind of what they kind of get to. You know what I mean? Like it was because of the wings and because of all that, if it wasn't an airship. Because when I think of an airship, it is just that. It's like a Zeppelin. A well, that's what Zeppelin I think. That, that, with a prop on the back. That's what I think they're describing. I think they're describing an airship with mecha propeller on the back. Because almost all the early sightings describe a cigar-shaped craft. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what a Zeppelin looks, or, or, or a dirigible, they call them. Oh, hmm. Here's some actual sightings, okay? Yeah. This is from the Chicago Record, Friday, April 2nd, 1897. This took place in Kansas, Missouri. It says, Missouri people excited, a mystical black object casting before it red light, startled the whole city for the last two weeks. At last descended, 10,000 people swear they have no hallucinations. Scoffers and disbelievers claim that people have been seeing the planet Venus or perhaps the evening star, even though, according to the almanac, this planet should have set below the horizon at least an hour before. The object appeared very swiftly, then appeared to stop and hover over the city for ten minutes at a time. Then, after flashing its green and blue and white lights, shot upwards into space, light gradually twinkling away and looking like a bright star. Now, that's a crazy... Sighting, right? Yeah, right. Here's another one. Everest, Kansas. It says people have sighted a strange airship. Competent reporters state that this must be the airship that was built in Oakland, California, and which broke away at launching time. This giant airship hovered for one half hour at a time and descended at regular intervals close to the earth. A giant searchlight flooded the whole city with light from this aerial monster, which with the velocity of an eagle darted up and away. Power source must have been attracted to the light for it dimmed as the sh ship went up and away. One observer stated that three there seemed to be a basket or a car beneath a great dark object the, thought to be a, a gas bag overhead. The car shaped like canoe and had four wings, two on each side, fore and aft. Light was greenish or blue against the light of the locomotive in the rail yard that was yellowish. Colored light seemed to be all around this car. That's the way they described it back then. So it does sound like it says canoe shaped or car shaped or something, and it had lights and some wings on it. So I'm like you were saying, I'm picturing a zeppelin with something mm -hmm. suspended beneath it. That maybe that's where the 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 pilots that were operating this thing. Well, and and then when you start to keep talking about the lights and all this stuff, I keep thinking back to the whole steampunk idea of the the idea of crazy lights and stuff on it. You know, but I, I know this. I know that I've had several friends of mine that have owned power chutes where are the cages with the wheels and the prop on the back, uh -huh. and it's got the parachute above it, and then they just take off and fly it around. You know you, you know what I'm talking about. We talked about getting one, actually, one time. Yeah, those are cool. I picture a bunch of guys together like that flying their Zeppelins, racing their Zeppelins around, and then you think about this. People are going to be people no matter what. If, if you flew your Zeppelin one evening and you went over a town, who people had no idea that things were even flying at the time. That's right. And the next thing you know, it's in the paper, and there's a buzz created about it, and people are going crazy about it. Wouldn't you be, you know, a lot of guys, because, I mean, it would be the same way. You'd be like, you know what? Let's do it again. Let's just mess with them. It's just an old school troll is what it's going to be. We're just going to fly over them, give them a hard time, make them think they're seeing crazy stuff. You know, you don't want to land it and be like, ta-da, it's just me, because then everybody, you know, I don't know, you kind of want to have something that nobody well, else has. there's kind of some stories about that very thing happening. Really? Let me continue on with some more sightings. All right. Now, this is from uh, a newspaper in Michigan. 
And this is in 1897 as well. It says, The people of Galesburg saw a brilliant white light approach from the southwest. The object appeared large and black with a crackling, sharp sound. It hovered close to the earth. Reporters state that they heard human voices from a loft from this airship. Hmm. When the ship went off, it seemed to be tipped with flame. The local comment was that the airship had accidentally caught fire. So there's another one. This sounds like it could be like a hot air balloon. They're right? keeping it up with hot air. And right? then, yeah, I'm a gotcha. I here's got you. Here's another one from Illinois. This is from uh, 1897 as well. This is in April, early April. It says, seen first at 8 p.m. in northwest, large red light was seen. Suggestions of a balloon are refuted because the airship flew at tremendous speed into a high wind. And that's all it says. But what was tremendous speed? In well, that that's day? right. I was going to say earlier when it was talking about the thing zoomed off like an eagle and stuff. Mm-hmm. To those people who have never really seen anything flying, I mean, like you're saying, how fast is really when they say fast? You know what I mean? Because yeah. they have nothing to um, give relation to something fast. Right. Uh, here's another one. This one's in Iowa. Between West Liberty and Cedar Rapids appeared a bright light, giant airship with steel body. When leaving, it appeared to be a large star weaving about. And stars do not weave around the heavens. The same report again within uh, with Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, it says the residents of Milwaukee cannot be talked out of what they are seeing. Thousands report the on- authenticity of a giant, beautiful airship with colored lights. The police records are show the full story, for they have been called in to answer. What is this? Hmm. So see, this is all happening all over: Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, Kansas, Missouri. They're happening everywhere, and they're even happening in California, Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma. I mean, they're everywhere. And here's another thing. Research indicates that there was various airship designs on the drawing boards at the U.S. Patents Office. Okay? Okay. So it wasn't like there wasn't people trying to get patents even for them. And on August 11th in 1896, patent number 565805 was given to a Mr. Charles Abbott Smith of San Francisco for an airship he intended to have ready by the following year. Another patent, number 580941, was issued to a Henry Heights of Elkton, South Dakota, on April 20th, 1897. Now, however, there were many UFOs that that were sighted, shaped roughly like these patent designs. There is no actual record showing that they ever actually built the airships that they got the patents for. They just got the okay. So they got the patents. But, man... If somebody does a demonstration for the U.S. War Department, they turn them down, and you start having all these sightings, and you got these other blokes that are in here getting patents for airships. Yeah. To me, there's a handful of people that are building these airships, like you said, and they're piloting them around. They're testing. You know, competition breeds technology. So if mm-hmm. you come up with something, and you're like, look at my airship, and the next week I'm going to get in my shop, I'm going to build one, I'm going to add this feature. Then another guy sees that and is like, wait a minute, I'm going to take what Cam and Kyle did, and I'm going to do this. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you got all these guys trying to outdo each other. It happens all the time. Cars. I mean, drag racing is a huge industry, and it's the same stuff. Guys just in their garage on weekends, tinkering, mm-hmm. trying to make their car an eighth of a second faster. That's exactly what I think this is. Well, and just so folks know, I remember I read some stuff on the Hindenburg when I was younger, and I remember that it was only, and it was big to me because it's a little over 800 feet long. That Zeppelin itself, and we all remember seeing the crash of the Hindenburg. Uh-huh. And stuff. But I, I want to say, and it's been a while, I want to say it's like 803 feet was what the length of it was. Now, there was one that they had built a little bit smaller than that. I'll say it was called like the Groft. And anyway, it was like 775, something like that. Really? But now, Yeah, but now this is enormous airships. This isn't saying these are enormous airships. All we're saying is, you know, if you only had one or two guys sitting in one and you wanted to make one quick and all that stuff, imagine if you only had one that's 100 foot long. You yeah. know, you see a 100 foot long streaking, funky colored airship racing across there, you know, and, 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 you know, I'm talking completely out of turn because I don't know what it would take to actually how big you have to do it. I would imagine by, to get the lift, you know, you need to have a certain amount of hot air contained to get that lift to make it. So you may have to have a bigger cylinder yeah, in order to raise just a couple of people. You know, you and I, I couldn't agree. build one as big as a hot, you know, we couldn't build one as big as a, I don't know, a, a like, a little, like, what is that, Danny Deck chair? What was that movie where the guy's got all the balloons tied onto, like, this <sighs> chair? I mean, you couldn't do something like that and have all of the equipment on it that they had and something. So, But I'm still not picturing something 800 feet. I'm picturing something no, roughly I'm sure it was a couple smaller. hundred feet. 
but it's just enough to make it be able to whip and move and be very, very peculiar to anybody that sees it. Yeah, and I like the description. The guy talked about the guy with the keyboard. I'm picturing a guy in like a top hat, a nice uh, steampunkish like suit with tails, and he's got this antiquated looking keyboard that he made up. I mean, not like a typewriter or yeah. a piano, but it's just a, a something with keys and knobs on it. Yes, and that's what he's turning, and this thing's moving around. Like we said, most of the sightings that happened between, and that's another thing, these sightings only happened during a small window of time, like around five years, and then they just quit. No one ever saw them anymore. And that's that's a very strange thing. Yeah, too, and they were it? all set, uh, they were shown are described as being cigar shaped. Mm -hmm. There are in fact numerous accounts of people that were on these ships talking to people. In fact, one of the things they usually asked for is when they met you, they they'd ask for water for their machines, like yeah. they needed to, to cool them off or something. I don't know. Now, one of the most intriguing uh, of these numerous contact stories involved a man who called himself Wilson. Now, the first incident occurred in Beaumont, Texas, nine, April really? 19, yep, 1897, when J.B. Ligon, a local agent for the Magnolia Brewery and his son Charles, noticed lights in the Johnson Pasture a few hundred yards away, and they went over there to investigate. They came upon two men standing beside a large, dark object, which neither of the witnesses could see clearly. One of these men asked Ligon for a bucket of water. Ligon let these men have it. And then the men gave him his name as Mr. Wilson. So the, the pilot told hmm. these guys that his name was Mr. Wilson, okay? He then told Lagon that he and his friends were traveling in a flying machine and that they had taken a trip out of the Gulf and they were re returning to the quiet Iowa town where the airship and four others like it had been constructed. So he's talking about that they flew all the way from Iowa down to Beaumont. Hmm. Now, if you're not familiar with Beaumont, I mean, that's like the southeast corner of Texas. Yeah. The water. Does it have anything to do with the fact that for like hydrogen? Because they used to fill them with hydrogen. Man, but I have hydrogen no idea. outlawed not long after the Hindenburg crash. Yeah. So before that, I mean, there's numerous gases what that are lighter that? than air. In the 20s or 30s? The it was hydrogen like in, or was it helium? The hydrogen was outlawed like in the 30s, I want to say, is when it was actually outlawed. So that could explain another reason why maybe it was that was the small window is maybe it made it harder and harder to get the what you needed in order to pull this this off yeah maybe and you know th th these guys he said his name was mr wilson they'd been flying from a town uh up in, in iowa, iowa and they said that there was four others of them that, that were been built when asked it says wilson explained the electric the electricity powered the propellers and the wings of the airship and then he and his friends got into this airship and they just watched it ascending away isn't that hmm. strange that is very strange. now the very next day on april 20th Sheriff H.W. Baylor of Uvalde, Texas. Mm -hmm. Been there. Right. Okay. He went to investigate a strange light and voices in the back of his house. When he went back there to see what was going on, he encountered an airship and three men. And one of them uh, gave his name. He said his name was Wilson. And he was from Goshen, New York. Right. Hmm. Now, Wilson uh, then inquired about C.C. Akers, former sheriff of Zavalia County saying that he had met him one time in Fort Worth in 1877 and now wanted to see him again. So th if you're not following the story, the sheriff one night at his house heard some sounds and some voices went out back, and, and then there was this airship and three guys. One of the guys got off and said his name was Wilson, and he was from New York. And then the guy Wilson is asking the sheriff about this guy, C.C. Akers. He's like, hey, man, you know who C.C. Akers was? And I guess this guy was a former sheriff. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I met him one time in Fort Worth. We're buddies. Now, Sheriff Baylor surprised replied that Captain Akers was now at Eagle Pass. And Wilson, uh, reportedly disappointed, asked him to tell his friend hello the next time the sheriff saw him. Um, Baylor reported that the men from the airship wanted water and that Wilson requested that their visit be kept secret from the townspeople. Then he and the other men climbed back into the airship, airship I'm sorry, and, and the quote says, its great wings and fans were set into motion and it sped away northward in the direction of San Angelo. The county clerk also saw the airship as it left the area. Now, two days later, in Josseran, Texas, a whirling sound awakened farmer Frank Nichols, who looked out of his window and saw brilliant lights streaming from a ponderous vessel of strange proportions outside of his cornfield. Now, Nichols went outside to investigate, but before he reached the object, two men walked up and asked him if he could have some water from his well. 
So they're always needing water. But maybe it's this too, though, because water is difficult to to take with you on a trip, and it's heavy. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, maybe they just got thirsty. That's what it is. Is maybe that's they're just they're thirsty. Maybe they just carry a little bit at a time because it's it's too much added weight. So they drink their fill. They keep it with them, and both of them, you know, they just have like little canteens. And they just that's when they land is because they got to get something to drink because you think that's a lot of weight to pack around with you when you're flying a dirigible from New York State to Texas to South Texas. Yeah, and I guess they just stop along the way. Think of though, man, you know how awesome it would have been to fly like that back then. There's nothing in the air. Everything you get to see is beautiful, untouched country. I mean, it's you know what I mean. You get to go out and cover a lot of areas before anything was was really built up the way it is. Yeah. That must have been beautiful. Must have been really cool. Oh, man. And, you know, I've never been in a hot air balloon. It's something I've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I heard it's really awesome and really beautiful. And, like, you would be changed if you ever did it because it's completely different than any other type of flying or or just being on a a tower that's real high. It's neat because you can move. And I always see the – I would love to do it over, like, Africa. Uh, No, thanks. In case what, you're afraid of it what failing it, yeah, and then just being it, yeah. mauled to death. You, you've seen that video of those guys, you know, when they go, what is it, uh, like dual survival? When they have to oh, try no, to you, sleep well, right you there? carry a pistol with you, and if that happens, you just put it in your mouth and you <laughs> oh, just end it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or I just shoot you in the hip, and then I take off the other way. That go way, ahead. That way you, they Let just, me they bleed out you, and yeah. the hyenas and yeah. stuff. Like, they just leave you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Anyways, back to the story. So these guys asked him if they could have some water from his well, right? So it says Nichols agreed to this as farmers in those days usually did. And then the men invited him uh, to visit the airship. So they said, hey, man, you want to come check this out? Did he get to go fly, or did he just go hang out on it? It doesn't say that he got to fly. It says when he he went to look at it, he noticed that there were six or eight crew members. One of these men told him that the ship's motive uh, power was on highly condensed electricity and that it was one of five that had actually been constructed in a small town in Iowa. Hmm. With the backing of a large stock company in New York, close to Philadelphia, where Keeley, remember this is the guy that mm-hmm. demonstrated his the his uh, flying machine to the U.S. War Department. <clears throat> so these people, they they saw them with the crew members. They told them that they were from this small town in Iowa again, where there was five of those constructed, and they said that it was built from the backing of a large stock company in New York. So there, it's being privately funded, hmm. and that's proof of it. Now, the next day, it says, on April 23rd, witnesses described uh, by the Houston Post as two responsible men reported that an airship had descended where they lived in Kuntz, Texas, and that two of the occupants had given their names as Wilson and Jackson. So this Wilson name this pops up a lot, This guy gets around. Right? Yeah, this yeah. guy is a world traveler for real. Yeah. Four days after this incident, on April 27th, the Galveston Daily News printed a letter from this C.C. Acres who claimed that he had indeed known a man in Fort Worth named Wilson and that Wilson was from New York and that he was in the middle. He was in his middle 20s at that time, and he was of a mechanical turn of mind and that went, then was working on aerial navigation and something that would astonish the world. So remember, that Wilson, mysterious Wilson guy, asked mm-hmm. the sheriff of Uvalde about the C.C. Acres, remember? And he told him, no, he's over there in Eagle Pass now. Mm-hmm. Well, if you see him, well, this is saying that, you know, Four days later, they actually found the C.C. Acres, and he's like, yeah, I knew a guy named Wilson that was in Fort Worth. He was in his mid-20s, and the guy was really good at mechanics and was, was studying navigation, of aerial navigation, and was working on something that he said would astound the world. So I'm kind of drawing all these ends together. Yeah. You know, and says, okay, finally, early in the evening of April 30th in Deadwood, Texas, a farmer named H.C. Legrone heard his horses bucking as if in a stampede. Going outside, he saw a bright white light circling around the fields nearby and illuminating the entire area before descending and landing on one of the fields. Walking to the landing spot, Legrone found a crew of five men, three of whom talked to him, while the others collected water in rubber bags. There you go. The man informed Legrone that their ship was one of five, again, one of five, that had been flying around the country recently, and theirs was, in fact, the same one that had landed in Beaumont a few days before, and that all the ships had been constructed in an interior town in Illinois, which borders Iowa, and that they were reluctant to say anything else because they had not yet taken out any patents. Now, this is what they told them. So to me, and it says after that, sorry, after 1897, almost all sightings of these mysterious aircraft stopped. So to me, that's all the proof I need. 
There are people who are seeing these things. There's mm-hmm. people that are coming down. There's patents filed. I don't know why I've never heard of this. And now that I've read all this, it took me a while to compile all these stories, by mm-hmm. the way. Now you know when you hear these people that are scoff and laugh when they hear about the Wright brothers are the ones that discovered flight. Because I've heard that before. People mm-hmm. are like, no, they're not the first. There's been other people that have done it. And the stories, are they're, they're always the same things. And see, a lot of them are in Texas. I had no idea. That's Probably because so it was so sparsely populated, too. Well, that's what they said. That there was a great area for testing these things. Same thing with Iowa. I mean, you, you've been to Iowa? Mm-hmm. Very flat, you know? Hmm. Have you ever heard of a Charles Del Chau? No, sir. Okay. In 1899, a man by the name of Charles de Chau, a grouchy old retired butcher, began to paint these amazing airships. His intricate collages showed ship-like decks supported by striped balloon pontoons. They showed bright-covered uh, helicopters and evil-looking striped dirigibles or zeppelins outfitted for war. They show crews of dapper little gentlemen so accompanied by their kids. Kind of right? Guy. This guy was painting this stuff in 1899. All of these paintings and drawings were part of Del Chau's private collection. They were not even discovered uh, until they were they were found in an old abandoned attic, along with a lot of Del Chau's notebooks and paintings. These were found many, many years later. Okay. It was his private collection. So he was painting stuff. He was keeping it. It wasn't like he was selling the art or anything. In these notebooks, Del Chau describes a secret club that he was a member of called the Sonora Arrow Club. Okay? Okay. The club, according to Del Chau, in his notes... The club was a secretive group dedicated to the creation of arrows or flying machines. Del Chau recounted how in his youth, some 50 years before, he and fellow club members gleefully ruled the skies of Gold Rush, California, piloting fantastical airships of their own invention. Now, isn't that neat? Now, there's, these notebooks and stuff and paintings were found well after this guy was dead. So they find these in an attic, and these notes talk about the same club. Now, Dachau represents himself as the club's draftsman and scribe, rather than one of its inventors or flyers. So he never claims that he invented He just was a member of this club. He never draws himself aboard any of these arrows. He illustrates a remarkable number of designs, maybe as many as a hundred. And he get, gave names to sub, uh, these airships. One was called Arrow Mio. One was called Arrow Trump. One was called Arrow Schnabel. One was called Arrow Mary. There's even an Arrow Jordan, which really? is like Air Jordan. So that's kind of funny. <laughs> they were all powered by a secret formula that Del Chau called both soup or sup. And he said it could both negate gravity and drive the ship's wheels, side paddles, and compressor motors. Now, one of the drawings uh, tells a story of Adolf Goetz. Arrow Goet is the name of his ship. He recklessly commandeered it. And he, by, it was uh, uh, recklessly commandeered by an unskilled pilot, and the airship got tangled in a sequoia tree. The interloper died of a broken neck. Yeah, that the admiral put on him. Right? It's his, a, his dirigible. Yeah. Another cautionary tale involves Jacob Misher, a pilot who went down in flames in the Aero Gander. Now, Del Chau hints that he was sabotaged by other club members who suspected him using the aircraft to make money by hauling cargo. So he's like, look, no one is supposed to know this is supposed to be a secret club. You're not supposed to be taking side work with these, you know. <laughs> right. Now, these are all in his notebook. So there's no there's no proof that any of this. Some people say he was a crazy old man and he made it all up. Why is it, though, a lot of those crazy old men you find out were right years That's later? That's exactly right. He, he points out in his notebooks that uh, most of the airships were to- totally safe. They were fun. And uh, he also depicts his aviators enjoying hot breakfasts and delights while on the ships. Uh, Dachau never seems to explain why the club worked so hard to protect its secrecy, but he shows the members going to great lengths to do so. By day, it even talks about the Aero Goet was disguised as a gypsy wagon so it could travel on open roads undetected. Dachau writes that a club member was banned one time for developing a machine because he talked to outsiders about it. And of course, even years after the club was disbanded, many of Dachau's own comments are re- rendered in code. So he'd had a lot of his notebooks were in code. So he doesn't even know what the, they don't even know what it says. Hmm. So whatever he was up to, it was very private. Now, this is all in somebody's private collection, mind you. So why would you go through all that trouble just to entertain yourself, hoping that one day somebody's going to find them? Exactly. I mean, one of the uh, drawings shows the heroic Peter Menace, a pilot of the Arrow Goose and creator of the near magical soup. Now, according to Dachau's notebooks, Menace died in 1860. Uh, with without a secret formula, the club could no longer fly, 
and they were forced to disband. So that's why they disbanded, because the guy that invented this material mystery soup, as they call it, he died without giving them the secret. And once he died, the club had to disband because no one knew how they couldn't fly anymore. Mm. So that might have been one of the reasons that everything folded up. Right. So this crazy old butcher. Mr. Del Shao, could these accounts be real like you were talking about? It's funny how sometimes these older gentlemen, you find out that they're not full of it, that they really did have something. And there may have been, was there really the secret society known as the Son Sonora Aero Club uh, where they flew these ships? I mean, it is really neat. Now, <clears throat> this is the crazy part. Okay, you ready for this? Okay. In one of Del Shao's, not if the story isn't crazy enough, in one of Del Shao's notebooks, which there are many in his collection, but one of the stories in his notebooks describes a mystery pilot named Hiram Wilson. The Wilson matches the sighting with the, the sheriff there in Uvalde, Texas. And uh, the pilot Wilson asked Sheriff about his friend C.C. Akers. Remember that guy? Mm -hmm. So why would this Del Shao have a guy named Wilson in his notebooks, private notebooks that was discovered many years later that happens to do with all those sightings where a guy stepped off an aircraft Said his name was Wilson. To me, there's no more proof. That's, well, well, now you don't need it because that's a collaborating story. That, that, that right there. That this this old fella just had a collaborating part of it. That all these other stories told. Now you find these. So you pretty much have to take that as his notebooks are real. You have to take as all that stuff really went down. It really happened that way. And it, it makes me question. It opens up a lot of doors because I'm like, first of all, what did this soup this guy invented? What you know? What was it that these other guys couldn't figure out? Two, was it, did the military finally step in and said, look, you know, we didn't know y'all were going to be doing all this. Now you're gallivanting all over the country with these things. This could really be used for, for bad, you know. Yeah. But maybe we need to step in and go, look, that's it. You know, we're going to take your patents. We're going to take over everything. Y'all are done. You know, find you another hobby type stuff. You know, I don't know. That's that stuff. That's a, a, an amazing piece of history that, that people need to be taught. I mean, yeah, that's, that's really what I'm so intrigued stuff. by. It. Yeah. I had no idea there were so many. And I'm going to put links up, folks, if you're interested there are tons more sightings than the ones I read. I just read a handful, uh, and most of the ones were the ones in here in Texas. But uh, they're all over the United States. But it is really bizarre. It happened for a short period of time. This happened all before the invention of flight, supposedly, and then they all went away. So I, I don't loved know. It. I loved it. That is, We're going to have to really take a look at more of this. The reason I want to check it out is just because I'm getting more and more fascinated with the guys that are like the do-it-yourself kind of stuff at home where they're doing some crazy technology. And it, like this here, I was going to tell you uh, – on Gizmodo, we all go to Gizmodo.com. It's great, but there is a guy, a YouTuber, has his own channel, and his uh, his name is the Hacksmith. And folks, for everybody that's seen Elysium, this guy kind of basically built one of these exoskeletons. He built one of those suits. It's not the full suit. This guy shows you how to build a lot of cool stuff. Like he built the like the, the guy that did the, the Wolverine claws. Right? Yes, <laughs> yeah, it's like that. This guy, this guy Hacksmith, is built like this. The ring from Iron Man. It's under his shirt glowing. He built an LED thing like that, so it really looks like it, that thing in his chest. Yeah. But what he did is basically he built with air actuators is kind of what it was, and uh, he's curling 170 pounds with it. Now, it, it's – don't get carried away because I did – when I first saw it, when I first found all this, I was all pumped up because, like I told you, I'm always looking for stuff. But all it is is this frame goes on his back, kind of like a backpack. Mm-hmm. And then it's he's got these little hooks on it that he's hooked this barbell in with this weight on. And he's using a trigger in his hand. And that trigger in his hand is runs to an air compressor. And when he hits it, the air compressor actuators go up. And then he takes it and it releases. And then he hits them and it goes up. It's just, it's air pistons, basically, working, right. doing the curling. So it's not really, you know, added to your body. It, it's not that level yet. It's not that crazy. But that's not what I got intrigued about it. What I got intrigued about it is this is how it all starts. A little drop in the bucket. This is how it always starts. Yeah. A guy at home goes, oh, I think I can just kind of piece this together. The same as these airships. And exactly. Then, and Somebody sees this as inspired, and then they come yes. up with their own creation. And then, then they build a little off of it. Oh, I like what you did. Oh, I think I can do that, but a little bit better. And the next thing you know is it just builds and builds and builds. And like you said, it's, it's a competition. It's a friendly competition. Uh -huh. of, I saw Hacksmith's stuff. I think I can build one better. Or, you know, I like his is out of air. I want to do one that's not pneumatic. I want to do one that's actually on my body, actually working and doing these things. But to me, like I said, this is a, a drop in the bucket because we even talked about it when we saw that Boston Dynamics and the, the, the robot suits that those men had built. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's a really cool thing when you were talking about that, just all this 
do-it-yourself kind of stuff is what I always think about. But, folks, yeah, check it out on Gizmodo or just go to YouTube and search up Hacksmith. He's got all of his videos up there. And, I mean, and he's got a bunch of videos up there, too, about just little knick-knacky stuff. But, like I said, I get caught up on that like crazy. So, yeah, I can get a little carried away from time to time watching it. But yeah, that's pretty cool. It made me think about it. Hey, Philly, we've got a couple of uh, new reviews. Yeah, I think we do. That come out. So we're going to run through those right quick. You know what always helps us out so much whenever we get them, and we love hearing from everybody, uh, says a new listener by Shruti. And Shruti wrote uh, a really super awesome review, and so thank you. And then Tallulah Big Cups wrote an awesome <laughs> review. <laughs> it's an awesome name, by the way. An awesome name. So thank you all both very, very much. It means a lot to us, folks. Like we said, if you want to or if you would, rate and review the show. If you're listening to it on iTunes or Wherever you're listening to it, please rate and review the show. It does help us out. It does help keep it up there, and it just also makes us makes us feel good. Yeah, thank you again to everybody that's written reviews. We really enjoy it. And don't forget, folks, if you like this show, we also have the Elite Show, and uh, we're going to be coming up with some neat stories this coming Thursday. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Van Meter Visitor. Cam, what are you going to talk about? I think I'm going to be talking about uh, the possible uh, Bigfoot refuge that was uh, started by Teddy Roosevelt. Awesome. So if you haven't signed up, folks, you need to. If you want to hear about those stories, signing up's easy. You go to the website, expandedperspectives.com. Look in the top right corner. You'll see a little tab up there where it says subscribe to Expanded Perspectives Elite. Click that. Very simple instructions. Sign up for PayPal. Uh, $5 a month is all it is, or 55 a year. And you'll be getting episodes every Thursday in addition to the every Monday show. So That's true. Hey, I got a quick shout-out I want to give to a uh, – because of the show, we meet and, and talk to all kinds of people. And we talk to them online, on phones. You know, we, we meet them in all kinds of social media. I'm a big fan of handmade, handcrafted things. Uh, they last. Well, and it's not just that. It's the fact that anytime somebody puts work into it, like when you, you find a fellow, and I don't know where he might be. Maybe he's in Illinois. Maybe he hand makes knives. I would rather spend the money on that to have a handmade pocket knife. Or I would rather spend the money to have a man hand tool out uh, a leather wallet that I'm going to carry. Or just like this, I got a buddy of mine online. His name's Justin Richardson, and he is a pipe maker. And he makes handmade tobacco pipes, and they are amazing. All out of briar. It's they're awesome. They're awesome pipes. And folks, for real, if you like to, if you know somebody that smokes a pipe, if you're thinking about smoking a pipe, or if you already smoke a pipe and want an addition to your pipe collection, hit this fella up. Go to Working Class 138, the word working, the word class, all together, and the number 138, Working Class 138 at gmail.com. That's Justin's email. Hit him up, and he will do custom pieces for you. You can tell him what you want. Y'all can go back and forth. Uh, it is awesome. He's what kind a, of tough are you talking about smoking out of this thing? I've got all kinds of tobacco. I brought a bunch of it back from when we were in Colorado. Oh, tobacco. Okay, I wanted to be clear yeah, what no, we were promoting. No, 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 we're not promoting that. No, no, not that I'm against it, but I'm not promoting it either. I'm just riding the fence. But yeah, Justin makes an... I mean, it's it's one of those things... You see somebody that's good at what they do, it makes you wish you could do it. I want one of those big, like, Gandalf-type pipes. A mirror... Oh, you want, like, the long one, the clay pipe that's real long. <laughs> yeah. You what Gandalf smoking the, uh, old Toby out of it. What are the ones like the uh, Germans and Austrians smoke? It's got a big bowl on it. You ever seen those? Mm -hmm. I don't know what they call them. I don't know much about pipes. It, it, I don't know that much about them. I know the white ones are like Meerschaum, and I don't think you're supposed to smoke them. You can, but it's better to put them up. You know, you're supposed to collect those. Oh. Where it looks like the carving of the face in them and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, that stuff's awesome. Coca-Bola wood. Yeah, I don't know what. What I need is a combination. If Justin, if you're listening, what I need is a combination <laughs> pipe. And fire piston. <laughs> so I can unscrew the top and use it as a pipe. When I need it for a fire piston, I can use it to light my fire. Well, you got to, you're to light your fire first to <laughs> yeah, even right. light your pipe. Exactly. Well, it's a tedious process. You're out in the woods. Oh, that's you true. You got nothing but time. That's true. <laughs> Whatever you could make someday. That would be awesome. It would be a awesome. A MacGyver pipe. A Swiss Army knife what pipe. What you make is a big fire piston and you let the kids use it like a pogo stick. Well, let them drop it not in your the kids. They would be making like bonfires around the house. Uh, no way. You imagine the bread on big pogo stick fire pistons? No, thank you. Yeah, no thanks. <laughs> hey, folks, if have you noticed any sound changes? Um, it's because me and Cam have kind of refurbed our studio here. Yeah, we made some changes, so we hope it turns out better. We're still, like I said, we're still working at that. We're still newbies at this. I mean, what? But we are coming up on our one year. We're getting real close on our one year, folks. So yeah, I was gonna say the last episode we tried some new software. There was a lot of distortion, so we apologize for that. Like you yeah. said, we're still trying to feel our way around, uh, but you know, hopefully, it's going to sound better in the future. 
Yep, hopefully it is. So thanks for sticking with us, folks. We've had a great time. Well, all right, folks, I think that just about does it for this episode. I hope you really like those stories we shared with everybody. I hope everybody has a really good Labor Day weekend and uh, have a good work week this week coming up. And and for those of you that are uh, members of the Elite Show, get ready for the Van Meter Visitor. That's right, and we're going to get ready. I'm going to also talk about little Theodore Roosevelt, baby. Yeah, I'm excited. I can't wait to hear that. I need to get the picture of him riding the moose on the river. There's a picture of that? Yeah, I think so. I think I've seen it. Like he looks like he's crossing a river riding a moose. I've seen the picture of the Sasquatch riding uh, Loch Ness monster. Y- yeah, that was a good, that? Yeah, that was a good photo. That was a good photo. <laughs> I'm going to find the Theodore Roosevelt photo. I'll try to find it and tweet it out. But I'm I don't know if it's real or not, but boy, it sure looks awesome. Yeah, don't forget folks, we have a phone number if you want to contact the show. It's uh 817-945-3828. If you want to send us any stories, if you want to send us any way to go, if you just want to say, you know, you're an elite listener or if you want to say you're listening to the show on regular, just go ahead, call us in, we'll play it on one of the shows coming up so absolutely you can always email the show expanded perspectives at yahoo.com that's the easiest way to get a hold of us Mm -hmm. you can follow us on facebook twitter everything else you know you can follow me and kyle too we love to hang out and talk and chat with everybody so absolutely well stay out of trouble folks come on yeah for real everybody can you not walk the straight and narrow for like five or six days please (laughs) you better watch out the man's gonna come get you if you don't that's right all right everybody have a safe work week Take care of everybody. And uh, for you elite listeners, we'll see you Thursday. Everybody else, we'll see you Monday. Everybody be safe. Peace.